Uh, hello, everyone. It's really an honor to get to speak to you today. Uh, someone who's been a longtime fan of TED Talks. I've used them in my classes. I've used them in my trainings. Uh, it's really an exceptional opportunity to get up here and speak to you. And so when I was given the invitation, I asked myself what I should talk about. And it occurred to me I should probably rely on something that we all have to do in a day-to-day -day setting, which is negotiate. Now, most of us aren't involved in arms control negotiations or hostage crisis negotiations. We're trying to buy a car or we're trying to get uh, a spouse to go to a movie with us that we want to see or maybe stop making that casserole that makes them sick every time they look at it. But you have to do those things very delicately. Uh, and so I want to fall back on is sort of my experience working at the United Nations. I was very lucky for a number of years to get to work with UNITAR, the United Nations Institute for Training and Research. Uh, and while there, I had a chance to do some, to meet some pretty incredible people. Uh, I had a chance to be the negotiation trainer for the African Union Ambassador Corps prior to the Rio Plus 20 Summit on Sustainable Development. When South Africa rotated back to the Security Council, I was brought in to train their negotiation on delegation management. Uh, and for me, coming from humble beginnings, that was very exciting and scary, quite frankly. And one thing that I have learned from working with hundreds of diplomats over the years is they taught me a lot more than I taught them. Uh, I could come in and give them academic things that you need to know in negotiations, how to evaluate BATNA, the best alternative to a negotiated agreement, how to use different types of tactics, high-low bargaining, anchoring, um, walkout strategies, all these kinds of things. But at the end of the day, the one thing that was made very clear to me is that managing emotions and relationships are the most important part of being a successful negotiator over an extended period of time. Uh, and speaking to a high-level early in my trainer, he said, observe the 70-30 rule. And he said, he was talking about East Asian negotiations in particular, that it's 70% EQ and it's 30% IQ. That yes, you have to have all the arguments and the strategies, but they are necessary, but by no means sufficient to accomplish what you want to do. And if you want to succeed, you have to learn to manage your emotions and manage your relationships in a way that sets the table to where success can be possible. I want to talk about three different aspects of doing this. And the first I want to talk about is the failure to empathize. I think a lot of times we think there's a right answer, a approach that everyone should be able to agree, according to rational choice theory, is the right way to progress. But this falls into the trap of what the great Nigerian writer Chimamanda Adichie calls the danger of one story. There's not just one story. There are lots of stories. And your ability to negotiate with people means you have to understand their interest. You have to understand what's important to them at a fundamental level. Not what you wish was important to them, not what you think should be important to them, but what in fact is actually of utmost importance to them. How do you go about doing this? First of all, you have to overcome the problem of projection. You're projecting your own interest and your desires onto them. They are flavored by your past. One of the most heavily studied examples of crisis management in history is the Cuban Missile Crisis. A young president, John F. Kennedy, had just been embarrassed during the Bay of Pigs fiasco. He felt like he had looked weak to the Soviet Union and they were going to take advantage of him in different parts of the world. Lo and behold, suddenly nuclear missiles are on their way to Cuba. JFK has to take a stand. His advisors are saying there can be no negotiation. There can be no compromise. We have to invade Cuba and make sure that no nuclear weapons are ever 100 miles off the American coast. So as the ships carrying the nuclear weapons from the Soviet Union near Cuba, the United States embargoes the island. And many people believe this is the closest we've ever come to actual nuclear war. At the height of the crisis, Khrushchev, the leader of the Soviet Union, sent JFK a telegram. And it was a very soft, moderate message saying we have to find a way forward. Within minutes, before JFK could respond to it, a second telegram arrives with a very hard line message associated with it, basically saying, you either stand down or there will be war. JFK was left with a dilemma. Which message do I respond to? His hard line advisors all said after the Bay of Pigs, you have to respond to the hard message. You have to escalate. It's a provocation. If you don't do so, our allies will abandon us. Happily for JFK, and happily for all of us, there was another person in the room, Tommy Thompson, who had served as an advisor to JFK, uh, sorry, sorry, to JFK and other presidents in Russia prior to returning to the U.S., and he knew Khrushchev well. Indeed, he had stayed with Khrushchev's family on a number of occasions. And Thompson figured out, 
oh my gosh, this is not Khrusha being bellicose. He has a domestic political crisis at home going on. He has conservatives pushing him. If he doesn't get a perceptual win, there might be a coup, and an even more hardline person might come into power. So Thompson said, sir, I advise you to respond to the softer message, the first message. Offer him a way out. Khrushchev has to have a win. Even if it's only symbolic, this is the only way forward. Put yourself in his shoes, Mr. President. And that's what Kennedy did. He guaranteed the U.S. would not invade Cuba, and the Soviet Union, in turn, agreed not to put nuclear weapons there. And JFK threw in the sweetener so that Khrushchev could claim victory that the U.S. would withdraw its missiles from Turkey, which were also very close to the Soviet Union. Now, what Khrushchev didn't know was that Kennedy had already made the decision to remove those missiles from Turkey prior to the conflict. He basically sold the Turkish missiles twice. But by doing so, he allowed Khrushchev to claim victory. And in and displaying the power of empathy, he was able to put forward a setting that allowed for success. The second thing that has to be considered is understanding external constraints. Khrushchev faced tremendous external constraints. He had a conservative group in his country that needed him to win or they might replace him, if one believes the accounts of history. We see something like that today in Israel-Palestine on a very fundamental level. Uh, I think a lot of people would like to see peace there, and they can see a path to peace in the middle ground. But the problem is, no matter what side of that conflict you support, both sets of leaders face daunting domestic constraints. If, for example, the Palestinians give in and maybe recognize Israel as a Jewish state in exchange for something else, even if they can get that deal with the Israelis, they have to go back to their people and back to the people of Gaza as well and sell that deal to them. If the deal discredits Abbas so much, then he'll be deposed and a more hardline person will come into power. Similarly, in the Israeli case, if their prime minister, Netanyahu, were to make massive concessions to Palestinians, what happens next? He has to go back to his government and sell it to their equivalent of the Congress. He has a parliamentary system. They have coalition government in Israel. His coalition is a center-right coalition. If he makes concessions, that coalition collapses. Suddenly a new government is formed. What if it's a more right-wing government? What if it's led by someone like Lieberman? Now that deal gets rolled back and things were even worse than they were before. Unless you are attendant to seeing things the way they are for the other side, and not just for yourself, you get yourself into no shortage of difficulties going forward. Finally, the importance of saving face. This concept is referred to a lot in talking about Asia, but it's certainly not a uniquely Asian concept by any stretch of the imagination. No one likes to feel like they're losing. Uh, a great Stanford University Business School professor, Joel Peterson, early in his career as a negotiator, wanted to establish his brand, his reputation, and he wanted to pick an area he would be firm on. He would give on other things, like perhaps deliverability of goods, what kind of properties would be involved, things like that, but price. Price would be his one thing he would never move on. He would make his reputation as taking a firm stand on price. Well, he had one negotiating partner who negotiated with him during dozens of different sessions. And after a while, he turned to him and said, I need you to do me a favor, Mr. Peterson. Mr. Peterson said, what favor is that? He's like, I need you, every time you come up with a number before a negotiation, to add 10% to that number and ask for more from me. Peterson looked puzzled. And he was like, look, Joel, if I never get a win on price, I look like an idiot to everyone I work for. I can never get a win on price. If you really need that final number, work with me to create a situation where you can win and I can win. We both save face. You got the number you wanted. I satisfied the people I work for. And we found a common way forward. Thinking about where the other person lands at the end of the deal is absolutely essential to deals being durable and to continuing partnerships going forward. The second package of things you should look at is managing emotions. Uh, we all use emotions to inspire us. There's a great saying that when you're angry, you'll give the best speech you wish you'd never given. Uh, you know, we're able to generate so much with that, and anger is a very human response. But managing your emotions is key to succeeding in a negotiation. Oh, two of them just went up. We'll take one back. Um, first of all, make anger strategic. You have to use it like a weapon, or more accurately, like a surgeon with a scalpel, uh, only exposing as much as you need to and being measured in your response. If you're that person who's always angry in a negotiating room, always getting upset, uh, you're one note. Uh, 
So when you want to indicate you're more angry or less angry, it's already, the volume's already on max, the ears are already distorted. You can't toggle or signal to people how relatively angry you are. If you're moderate in your anger, you can make great ground. More than that, if you can avoid being angry at times, because during negotiations, there are often people who are spoilers as parts of negotiation teams. They don't want things to succeed. They want to get you angry to scuttle things, and you don't want to fall into that trap. One of my favorite stories from when I was in college, um, I was debating with one of my best friends in the world. As a matter of fact, he's going to be my best man in my wedding in three weeks when I get married, uh, a guy named Steve. Uh, and we were at a debate competition. I went to college on a debate scholarship in Utah. We were at a big competition. There was a very large crowd. We were in the championship round debate. Steve was in a cross-examination period with a debater from the other team, and they were talking about poverty. And Steve invoked a book by John Rawls called A Theory of Justice. And the person he was debating, who was a little bit countryish, I was sitting next to him during cross-examination and said, huh, you can read that? Now, Steve, large African-American male. This person, very hickish. Steve was like 6'4", 300 pounds, an all-city football player in San Francisco. He could have taken this kid and stuffed him into a garbage can. You know, and as soon as he made the comment, oh, you can read this, the racial overtones were very clear to everyone in the room. There was some gasp from the back of the room. And I know Steve has a temper. And as I looked at Steve, I was like, uh-oh, am I going to have to grab my buddy before he, like, punches this guy? But what Steve did was he stopped, he looked at the person, sighed, and shook his head. All the weight of having to deal with this oppression, he was going to rise above it with class. As soon as that happened, his partner literally started to scoot her seat toward the wall. There was distancing going on. The crowd sort of was muttering about it. We had the rest of the debate, but that debate was already won in the eyes of the judges in the crowd because we had taken the high ground when anger was still available to us. Uh, the best revenge is victory. Uh, Steve could find him in the parking lot later if he wanted to and resolve things there, but for now, in the debate, we had the focus on getting the win. And that's why Steve became a national champion. You have to understand emotion and architecture and how they snap together. Uh, William Urry, one of the co-authors of the famous negotiation book, Getting to Yes, talks about sort of the feng shui of a negotiating room. Uh, you want to have an architectural environment that works for you. Uh, you don't want desks facing each other like adversaries. You want to create dynamic where people work side by side, so you can subtly feel like you're working in a team setting. When things get difficult, change the setting. Go for a literal walk in the woods. It can make all the difference in the world. Now, of course, Architecture can send a different message as well. There's a great story about Ambassador Richard Holbrook, who was U.S. representative in Europe during the Bosnian War. And he was going to sit down for negotiations between these parties who were involved in a very brutal conflict. And the U.S. was contemplating a bombing campaign in Bosnia at that time. So they met for the negotiation at the U.S. Air Force Base. They thought they were going to go to a conference room. But no. Mr. Holbrook walked them to an aircraft hangar walked him into the hangar where there was a bomber jet. Then he walked them over to the jet with the bomb bay doors open where the bombs go, and right below the bomb area was the table where they negotiated at. So every time they looked up, they saw what would happen next if the negotiations failed. Bombing. Not very subtle, but very effective in that setting. <laughs> Your architecture can make a really big difference as to how things go. You also have to account for what I call duper's delight. Uh, what happens if things go well? What happens if you start to win? Who here has seen a National Football League game before? Actually, not that many of you. Okay. In, in tackle football, when like, you sack the quarterback, there's often something called sack dancing that occurs. So the person who does the tackling, like this, goes, Woo, I'm the greatest. I sacked him. I'm wonderful. Trying to fire his team and the crowds up. You'd be surprised how often that dynamic asserts itself in a negotiation. When someone feels like they've done well, that big smile passes over their face. Aha, I gotcha. That's a signal to the other person. They left things on the table that they somehow lost. When I work with my clients, I train them that when you win, that's when you have to look silently a little discouraged. Like, ah, oh, I'm going to have to settle for this. Even though as soon as you get to the bathroom back at wherever you work, you're going to be doing a sack dance all your own, you have to wait for the sack dance. And so don't skunk your own victory by celebrating prematurely. Don't hang the mission accomplished banner until the mission is really accomplished. <laughs> Finally, you have to focus on building relationships. Uh, negotiations are rarely one-off. Negotiations tend to be serialized by their nature. 
Uh, if you work in a small industry, a specialized business, if you work in the world of government, it's a very small world. You keep running across people again and again and again. Uh, it's why when you work with top negotiators, they don't teach you these little gamey skills like high-low bargaining, uh, like walkout strategies, because they recognize those are only short-term strategies. And if you employ those unpleasant kind of negotiating techniques, people will choose to do business with someone else. You want to create a situation where people want to do business with you again and again and again. In building relationships, you have to make people trust you. You have to make them want to work with you. But they have to know how you're going to react in the crunch. Uh, once you've made a deal, you have to implement a deal, and you'll deal with them again. They want to know that when things go badly, you're able to recover from it and move on at a fairly good level. And that's difficult for people to do. Uh, you have to show that you can make fun of yourself and that you're an interesting person to work with. I'm going to give you two quick examples of this. The first example was when I was training a group of diplomats from a lesser developed nation. Uh, we broke into a simulation group, and one of the delegates from Palestine uh, had to take a phone call. So the rest of his group went off to work, and he was slow getting back, and they were late, and I could see people were starting to get annoyed. And when he came back into the room, he stopped, he paused, and said, Oh, I'm sorry I'm late. I was caught at a checkpoint. Now, for those of you who know about the Middle East, the Israelis have checkpoints in the Palestine. Uh, and it's a common problem to be caught at a checkpoint. So the room broke into laughter. It was a room full of diplomats from lesser developed nations who were, frankly speaking, not big fans of Israel. It worked. His humor worked. But if an Israeli diplomat had been in there, he would have thrown himself into an incredibly angry fury. He would have walked out. So you have to know the kind of humor that works. Not all humor works the same, and you have to know what your talents are, whether you're funny or not, because there's nothing worse than failed humor. It just, it's a bad look. Uh, the safest kind of humor to use is self-directed humor, making fun of yourself. It implies that you have enough confidence that you're not insecure, and it sends a signal to people that when things go wrong in the future, you won't melt like Frosty to Snowman on a hot summer day. You'll be able to hold things together and still be strong as a partner for them. Uh, I lived in Korea in my late 20s. I was recruited to come over and work in a business setting there. The first night I arrived, I was extremely ill-prepared. I bought my Korean phrase book for the plane. Uh, I'd never been to Asia before. Uh, I arrived. They take me to an apartment. I drop my bags off. They immediately took me to a dinner to meet the staff and important clients. So I throw on a white shirt. I stagger out the door. We go to this restaurant. They've rented a huge area. I'm at the head table with the owner of the business. We're surrounded by people. I sit down because we're on the floor, which is new to me, but I'm okay. I'm going to make it work. Uh, and then a horrible realization comes to me that I've never used chopsticks before, and there's not exactly a fork sitting in front of me. So I'm looking at the dishes here. Everyone's kind of watching me to see how I'm going to react. I reach for the kimchi. I don't know how many of you really have had kimchi before, but generally it's very red and very vibrant in a sense. So I go to pick it up. I got to get the first bite. Plop. Lands on my shirt. <laughs> Pick up the second bite, plop on my shirt. Force the third one in, fourth drops down again. Basically within five minutes, I looked like I was the victim in a gangster movie. Got red splots all over me, and all I want to do is just get up and go back to my apartment and forget this ever happened. But I made myself look around the room at the laughter and went, if I can just laugh with them, if I can show I'm okay with this, I think this is the way to go. And I made myself do it, painful though it was. And it really helped. It cemented a relationship with people. They showed that even though I wasn't prepared, I hadn't learned how to use chopsticks, I could at least laugh at myself and still move on. So it's a very effective thing to do, to make fun of yourself when you're operating from a place of security. So humor in that context can be extremely effective. You also have to be attendant to cultural sensitivity. I think we all respect how profound cultural differences could be. When I was in Korea, again, uh, a Canadian friend of mine had his family come over to visit. And a Korean family we knew invited us over for dinner. And so the Canadian family comes over. They sit down. The Korean family brings out the food. It's a table full of great food. The Canadian family kind of gasps at the amount of food, but goes, OK, literally rolls up their sleeves and gets down to eating. And they're through about three quarters of the food on the table. And I noticed the two Korean, uh, the husband and wife, look at each other, kind of shocked that the food is going Way, suddenly the wife gets up and runs back to the kitchen. Okay, 
You hear pots and pans clanging. Okay. She's like, oh my gosh, you know, I gotta make more food. So the Canadians, they struggle to the very end. They're like, oh, I've done it. You know, great, I finished all that food. She comes out with a whole set of new portions. They're like, oh no, but they're back to eating. And you saw a moment of cultural difference. In Canada, if you don't finish the food in front of you, it's insulting to the person who made it. In certain parts of Asia and other places, if people finish their plate and you don't have more food for them, that's an insult. And they were caught in this cycle of cultural difference. <laughs> My friend and I let it go on for a little while before we said something. It was pretty amusing to us. Um, but it's not always as funny. It, it can actually make a huge difference sometimes in terms of how things play out. Think about the difference between Texas and China. I've negotiated with Texans before. You should walk up to them. You should look them in the eye. You should speak directly. And your handshake better be real strong if you want to earn their trust. Imagine you show up in Shanghai and you meet a senior b businessman from China who's older than you. And you walk up and go, hi, I'm Nick. You know, I'm excited to do business with you. I'm staring you in the eye, and I put my death grip handshake on you. <laughs> That's just not going to work out very well, is it? Uh, you have to understand the context you're operating in. Uh, Hillary Clinton learned this lesson very painfully on her first trip to Asia. Uh, very early as Secretary of State, she went to Asia, and she started to talk to China. The first thing she wanted to talk about was a succession strategy for when Kim died. What a disaster, right? You don't bring up death in that kind of a setting, certainly not as your opening move, and certainly not as the first female Secretary of State to arrive in that kind of a setting. It went off to a horrible start. She recovered as time went on. Styles are different. One of the most telling conversations I had was with the former ambassador to the UN from Pakistan. And he worked with two US ambassadors to the UN. John Bolton, violently anti-UN, uh, neoconservative, very anti-Islamic, and Bill Richardson, who helped negotiate the release of hostages from North Korea, a highly successful diplomat. And someone asked him in front of me, who did you like working with more? And I thought it was the stupidest question I'd heard in my entire life. Of course he wanted to work with Richardson, and I was wrong. He was like, with Bolton, I always know where Bolton stands. If he tells me something, I believe it. He's a straight shooter. But Richardson, he's like a bar of soap. Every time I think we have something and I'm grabbing onto it, it just slips away and falls to the floor. I want the straight shooter. In that case, Pakistan was a little more like Texas, and the negotiators need to recognize that within their dynamic. So there are lots of things to be attendant to in this regard. If you want to succeed as a negotiator, you need to be prepared. You need to understand the chess game of negotiations, whether it's buying a car or trying to resolve an international crisis. But you have to be very clear about being attendant to emotional considerations and relational considerations if you want to succeed over a long period of time. The difference between being a legend in your own time as opposed to a legend in your own mind, between getting a victory and a pariah victory, is your ability to grasp those tools. And I wish you the best of luck in doing so. Thank you.